Hey guys, how's it going? It's Sean from the US. Wow, we're already at part five of the natural English listening series. As always, this video includes both English and Korean subtitles for you all to follow along with as you're listening. 그리고 저는 요즘 멤버십 프로그램을 하고 있는데 새로 영상을 올릴 때마다 영어 대본과 한영 자막을 자유롭게 설정할 수 있는 영상도 멤버들에게 올려드릴게요. 관심 있으시면 아래 설명을 참고해 주세요. Without further ado, let's begin. Hi, where are you from? Hi, I'm Bella and I'm from Australia. So how long have you been living here in Korea? I've been in Seoul for three years. So as someone who's been living here for three years, mm -hmm. what are some lessons that you think Australia could learn from Korea? Mm -hmm. And vice versa, what are some lessons in any capacity mm -hmm. that Korea could learn from Australia? When I was first thinking of this question, one thing popped into my mind and that thing is company culture. Okay. Um, and I spoke to a Korean friend and also my hairdresser <laughs> right. who lived in Australia and they both said the same thing. The thing I've noticed with like Korean company culture is it's really strict and really hierarchical. Mm -hmm. Right? So you definitely have your boss and your manager and your subordinate and their positions are really defined. Um, and I feel like it's also in the language that they have to use as well. You can't just call them by their name. You have to say teamjangnim or sajangnim or whatever in their position and the subordinates are just there to kind of do the stuff that the upper people don't want to do. It kind of in a way stifles creativity because the upper management are not really listening to the younger people who usually have more creative ideas. Whereas I felt like when I was working in Australia, I worked at a hospital, but anyway same kind of office environment. I could talk to my boss's boss's boss and just call him by his name and just be like, hey, what's up? I need help with this thing. And he would be like, yeah, sure. And he would sit down and help me as if we were equals. It didn't feel like I was stupid for asking him a question or something like that. And actually... And I bet the company really benefits from this kind of uh, relationship. Yeah, I think so. And also, I was really young at the time and I was the new person on the team, but there were some ideas that I introduced that they actually implemented in the future for when they were doing tests and things like that. Yeah. So I felt like I was really listened to and valued as an, like part of the team. Whereas here it seems like you're part of the team because you have like a function. Yeah. Almost. And not only that, but in Korea too, it depends on the company, things yeah. are changing, I know. But you still have the idea that you can't leave until your boss leaves. Right. Even if you have nothing to do. And yes. you have to go to Hui even though you don't want to. And you have to drink, even though you don't want to. And there's a lot of kind of extra obligations in Korean companies that I feel like don't apply to Australian companies. Just to play devil's advocate. Yeah. Do you think there are any positive or benefits to this kind of strict hierarchical working culture? There is a benefit and okay. the benefit is productivity mm. and that's what Australia lacks which is what I was going to say is because well, look at that transition yeah, yeah. <laughs> Australia has really good work-life balance but it means that everything's really really slow <laughs> uh. you order something in the mail it comes two weeks later you are trying to get like customer service it takes them weeks to fix it you know, whereas in Korea, if I want something done, they're like, is it okay if you wait half an hour? <laughs> like, of, of course I can wait half an hour. I thought I would have to wait two weeks. Yeah. So I think that kind of structure is definitely better for like productivity and doing things at a faster pace, which is Excellent what I point. think Australia needs a little bit more of. Mm. Um, the thing I miss the most whenever I go back to Australia is how fast and convenient everything is here. Everything over there closes at like 5 p.m., 6 p.m. The shops are closed, which is good for the employees, but not good for people who want to go out and do things. Yeah. yeah. People who rely on these services mm -hmm. that are only available in a very relatively small window of time. Exactly. So as someone who has lived in both countries, mm -hmm. which one do you think is preferable? While I'm young right now, 
I think Korea is more preferable to me. Okay. Specifically Seoul, because it's such a big city. Um, I haven't lived in the countryside of Korea, so I don't know. But the conveniences here definitely appeal to me as a young person. Right. But if I was a bit older and maybe just working in an office or wanted a more stable life, then I think Australia would be better because there's such a good work-life balance that work isn't my entire life. I can leave the office at 5, 6 p.m., go have dinner with friends, go to the gym or something like yeah. that, and I don't feel obligated to keep working. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it seems as though both countries are very good places to live. Yeah, I think so. So it's funny how they're so opposite in this way, but both have a very high quality of living and mm -hmm. a high standard of living. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because I used to teach English to adults and they would go abroad to America or Australia yeah. and they would come back and ask me, why do you like Korea? Yeah. <laughs> I hear that question a lot amongst my young Korean fr friends as well. Yeah, like why do you want to be in Korea? Because yeah. actually the competition here is really tough. Not yeah. only for employees, but also for people in school, right? Yes. Uh, there's basically no competition in Australia. Yeah. In school, we're all helping each other. It doesn't matter if they get 100%, I also get 100%. So it's a really different environment. Um, and maybe there's also a benefit because we're foreigners here. Because I don't know what it's like to live in Korea as a Korean. Right. So For if sure. I was Korean, maybe I would feel differently. Um, yeah. But yeah, different qualities of life, but definitely both have good and bad aspects to them. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really interesting though, because uh, in Korea, the land size is so small. So But small. actually the population is higher mm. than that of Australia. Is that right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Australia is like yeah, 30, the... 40 million, right? No, less than that. Less than it's that. like 20 something. Wow. The population of Gyeonggi-do is like just under the population of all of Australia. No way. Yeah. But yet the uh, <laughs> land size of mm -hmm. Australia is massive. Yeah. Rivaling that of the US. Yeah. Like so very similar. The resources are completely different. Right. Korea. They need people. Yeah. People are much more in need in mm -hmm. terms of like specialized work and like even hard labor. Yeah. You know? Whereas Korea is the opposite. It's like there's too many doctors here. Who, yeah, well that was a problem figure, right? recently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the biggest resource in Korea is human resource, um, which is why there's so much competition in the first place. So it is kind of creating this like social problem right now. Yeah. Right, and everyone wants to stay in Seoul. That's why Koreans, mm -hmm. if they go to school here and they go anywhere else in the world, they're overqualified, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think both countries are really nice to live in, yeah. um, but definitely they could stand to learn from each other a little bit, yeah. Excellent, lovely, let's let's wrap it up there. Okay. Right, thank you so much. Thank you for having All right. me. Bye. Bye. Hi, where are you from? Hi, I'm Chad and I'm from the United States. So what are some lessons that Korea could learn from the US? And what are some lessons that the US could learn from Korea? In any regard. One of the things I think that the United States can really learn from Korea is healthcare. So, mm. you know, it's, it's pretty, common knowledge that the healthcare system in the United States is, is very expensive. You know, mm -hmm. healthcare costs are, are through the roof. A lot of people can't really afford it despite many efforts to, to change it over the years. But here in Korea, but the quality of care here and the availability of care here versus the United States, I think is something that the U.S. could really learn from. Yeah, and like, I really like paying a certain amount a month, even though it's a bit expensive, but Man, it's nice to know that it's there, you know? Yes. And I guess that's kind of one of the, the main utilities of insurance. You're buying not only the actual insurance, you're buying peace of mind. Yes, Yeah. Absolutely. So I like how that is set up in Korea. It's a lot of doctors, it's a lot of hospitals, the skill, the quality is high, and it's not that expensive. I, I believe all people in Korea now are required to uh, be covered under the national healthcare system Correct. that we have here. Correct. Right. So, you know, having universal coverage like that really, really does add that peace of mind that yeah. you know that you have this insurance and can go to the hospital when you really need to. So another thing that uh, I think, but this time I think that Korea can learn from the U.S. is work-life balance. And, mm -hmm. and there is actually this a word in Korean for work-life balance. I believe it's like a Konglish word. Um, for work-life balance. The and, world, world, la, I yeah. could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure of it myself. And I know that there are efforts being made to sort of, you know, 
bring this balance because mm. there's a very strong work ethic here in Korea. Right. Uh, and sometimes that's at the expense of people, you know, enjoying their lives to the fullest, going out and, and having a family or spending time with friends and, and having experiences. They're right. so consumed with, with work um, that they don't get to experience these things. Whereas in the US, you know, we experience those things a lot. I think we have a, a much better sense of work-life balance or maybe even too far in the other direction that, uh, that I think that's something that Korea could really learn from, from the United States is bringing, bringing a little bit more balance to... Harmony. Yeah, yeah harmony between work and life and, and being able to balance the two. Right on, that's a really good point. Yeah, just my experience working in academies, hagwons here, English academies, it's so common that especially when you're just starting to work there, there's like no vacation days. Yeah. And like you're expected to show up, even if you're sick, you show up. This was of course before, you know, social distancing and all that sure. stuff now. But, and really the economy really gets bolstered and like the production of the entire country just goes through the roof with this kind of mentality. But you're so right, like there really is a balance. I think the perfect balance lies somewhere in the middle. Yes. Oh, between vacation and you know this. So I think recently within the past few years, it's gone to now a maximum of 52 hours a week. Yes. I, which I, I, I think I, is fantastic. Right. Yes, same. Yeah. That yeah, sounds great. It is really good. I think yeah. in the US, 40 hours a week is full time. Right? Yeah, 40 hours is full time. It's and I'm pretty not, standard. Yeah, that's pretty standard for, for a work week for, for those in the US. But I'm not sure if there's a cap on the amount of overtime you're allowed to do in the US. Like here, it's 52 hours, but I'm not sure if a cap even exists in the US, perhaps because they don't really need to be told. It's not a they problem. Have, they yeah. already have that sense of, no, no, yeah. no this, is, this is too much overtime to be working. You know, go home, spend time with your family, go out and, and have some fun. Right. So another, another thing that's very different, or at least in my mind, very different between the US and Korea is the sort of collective mentality that, you know, a lot of people here share, especially with, you know, the virus recently, you know, it's, you, you go outside and you see everybody wearing a mask, you know, almost just unequivocally wearing a mask. Some people will chastise others if they see somebody not wearing a mask, but everybody just knows that that's what you're supposed to be doing. And it's for the public good for me to just suck it up and, and wear this mask versus in the United States where people are a little bit more uh, focused on themselves and, and you know, in, in the most harsh words, you know, they're a little bit selfish. Mm. You know, I don't want to wear a mask because that impedes on my freedom to not wear a mask. So therefore, I'm just not going to do it. Mm. You know, I, I feel like Koreans have a, a lot better sense of this is good for all of us. The sooner we all just get on board with doing this thing, you know, the shorter amount of time before we can go back, you know, in this case, to not wearing masks again. Whereas, you know, in, in, in the US, you know, this sort of stubbornness will just prolong the problem. But, uh, but, but that can be applied to a lot of different areas. Right. You know, in, in, in Korea versus the United States, lots of, lots of collectivism and, and, you know, looking out for, for each other. You know, I believe in Korean, they call it John. I find that in, in America, that sentiment of like patriotism and like us, us all being Americans really was at its peak in World War II. Yeah. And it started to really decline. There was a rift during the Vietnam War. Yeah. I kind of wish America was a bit more like that, like bond together as Americans. We're right. so torn apart right now. It's really sad to see. It is, yes. I mean, yeah, I, I would love to see more of a sense of, you know, you know, we're all in this together. Yeah. You know, let's all, you know, pull together and just get through this all together. Yeah. And then we can return to a, a sense of normalcy. Um, I agree with you, you know, World War II was, was definitely a point where we saw a lot of unity. Yeah. You know, there were problems back then as well, no doubt. But, you know, we saw a lot of unity then. More recently, I would say, right in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, though. True. I think we saw a lot of unity um, between Americans, you know, all bonding together over this, over this tragedy that had happened. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's, you know, a more, a more recent example of, of the same thing. Right. Right. And I know it's extremely contentious and controversial thing to talk about, like, America and its, you know, unity. When was America, you know? at its peak in terms of this regard, but right. we're not gonna get into all that here. No, 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 no. Is there a point when this collectivist mentality could go perhaps too far? 
I think so. Okay. Yes, I, I do think that there is a point where, you know, this collective sense is detrimental to individual well-being. Okay. So sometimes that might come in the form of a feeling of a sort of obligation to society or to uh, perhaps to your family in a more you know narrow sense, um, where it might really impede on individual ambition, mm. opportunity, know, opportunities. Yes. Yeah. So I want to go out and I want to accomplish this, but I have these obligations to my family mm. and perhaps to my my company or to my friends or to my country that I have to fulfill, and and that's you know that's sort of holding me back from the best that I can be or things that I want to accomplish. So I, I definitely think that there is a limit to, you know, the effectiveness and, and the good that comes from that sort of sense That's of collectivism. Really, really well said. I love what you said. And it makes me think how interesting Korean society, South Korean society really is because they're both collectivists, but very, very capitalist. Yes. And right. they're kind of opposite. They are, you know, they are. Um, it makes more sense to see a very collectivist culture, like in a more communist or socialist setting. Absolutely. But South Korea is very capitalist and look how successful they are, mm -hmm. yet they're extremely collectivist. Exactly. Yes. Isn't exactly. that so cool? I think that that's, I, I think that's something that South Korea has done so well, mm. is that they've sort of found this balance between capitalism and collectivism. Mm. You know, some people may have, you know, heard me speaking moments ago about, about collectivism and like, oh, well, that sounds like socialism. Like that sounds like, you know, that sounds like North Korea, not South Korea. Yeah. But I think South Korea has just found a good balance between, you know, that collective sense while also pairing it with capitalism. Right. Yeah. And that's so interesting because, you know, North Korea and South Korea, they're both Korea. And yeah. they both speak the same language. And they haven't been separated that long. Not that long. 60, 70 years. Yeah, 70 years. So, before that they were all Korea, but see how differently North Korea turned out as mm -hmm. a, you know, communist country. Mm -hmm. And how much South Korea has bloomed and thrived. Absolutely. So. Yeah, so I mean, that, that might be the best example, I guess, yeah. of, of it going too far. Perhaps that's the other side of the coin, you know. Yeah. You've got you know, you've got capitalist South Korea that, that found this, this balance, but then you've got North Korea, the other side of the coin, that might be an example of collectivism gone too far, if you will. Yeah, if you want to call it that. Yeah, yeah right, I mean. We're just having fun yeah. pontificating here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do. But anyway, let's call it a day. Sure. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much, okay. Chad. Thank you. All right, it was thank fun. You. Had a great time. All right. Bye. See you later. Hi, how's it going? Good. Cool. Where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada. So, are there any lessons that Canada could learn from Korea in any aspect of life, cultural, societal, the way they run things in any way. What lessons can they learn from Korea? In general, I think, you know, Westerners look, uh, look at Asia in general, but specifically Korea as well, uh, for their sort of hard work ethic and their perseverance mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to their work and their jobs. Yeah. Um, sometimes too much so, to a fault. Okay, so you think Canadians could use kind of a lesson in work ethic? Yeah. Is, is that lacking right now in Canada in some facility? Um, yeah, without generalizing too much, yeah, I think uh, overall the, the sort of the dedication to their jobs, just in terms of how much commitment is put into their job. Yeah. Is there anything else you think societally or culturally that Canada could learn from Korea? Um, family? Family, okay. Yeah. Um, the importance on family. The importance of family, like just the spending more time with family, I guess. That doesn't really happen as much in, in North America in general, I think. So you think the importance on family is much higher in Korea? Yeah, I think What so. are the benefits to this kind of importance that is placed on family? Uh, learning traditions and okay. sort of where you come from okay. and you know, your kind of roots, the, the history of you know, who you are and where you come from. and and that sort of thing. So I'm gonna ask you the opposite question. Are there any lessons that Korean society or Koreans, Korea in general could learn from Canada? Koreans could definitely learn how to hug more. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's the one thing that I do miss is, uh, I'm a hugger. I mean, that's not a, that's not, it's a, 
very specific type of human being in North America as well. What is <laughs> hey, come here, yeah, buddy. Yeah. Give us a hug. Yeah, yeah, even meeting new people, you know, like if, if, if you spend a few hours together over dinner or whatever, and when you part ways, I mean, a hug is... It's not out of the norm, <laughs> right? It happens. Uh, so what is a hug here? What do you think it means? Um, is, it, is there always some kind of like... Uh, sexual connotation to that like you only hug your girlfriend you only hug your husband yeah i don't know if it's sexual i think it's more it's just a physicality that is not in the culture right okay so would you hug your wife's friends in canada oh absolutely yeah yeah there's a lot there's... you'd all play poker together you'd have dinner yeah when you're going home oh it was so fun see you next time yeah. give him a hug I mean, they say like goodbyes in Vancouver, especially like in North America, goodbyes take an extra long time, especially if there's a big group, because everyone has to exchange hugs at some point and then yeah. part away, right? So I miss those, those uh, casual hugs, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, yeah, casual hugs. Your parents are from Canada too, right? Um, they, well, they were born in Korea. They immigrated to Canada in the late 1970s. Right, so you're saying that they're pretty bilingual, right? They are. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, Korean is still their native tongue and um, they're most comfortable in that language. So are your parents huggers? That's really what I, oh, I want to know. Good question. This is the juicy content. Yeah, no, not so much. Yeah, not so much. Although, having said that, I have, I have caught my parents hugging their friends. Uh, not Korean friends, but their like, Western friends, uh, Canadian friends. Um, yeah, they do hug once in a while with their, those friends. Yeah. Um, you're a hugger. I'm a hugger. <laughs> uh, well, not these days because of the you know the whole that's very situation, true. Situation, yeah. but no so, hugging going on these yeah, days. Yeah, or handshakes, a little. That must be hard for you as a hugger. <laughs> <laughs> it does hurt a little bit, but you know I've got a wife and two children that there you go. make up for it. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that you like dogs. Oh, I'm a total dog person. More than cats. I'm definitely a dog person. I feel like dogs are much more physical, so you can absolutely the same way you would hug a friend if you're a hugger. Absolutely. <laughs> you can. Uh, kind of embrace a dog in the same way. You can hug a dog, you can kiss the dog on the right. head. Right, they are much Snuggle with the dog. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can with cats, it's but... It's true, it's not the same I though. just don't trust cats. Me either, yeah. they, they scratch you and... Yeah, something in their eyes, I just don't trust yeah, they, them. Yeah, their, their mood changes on a dime. Absolutely, and like, a cat can leave the house for a whole day and come back and it's like, okay, well, you've been gone for the day, but a dog goes out for a day and it's like, where have you been? What are you like? How is this even possible? But yeah, I'm definitely a dog person. Well, thank you so much again, thank James. You. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Hi, where are you from? Hi, I'm Chad. I'm from the United States. So, how long have you been in Korea now? Total time less than two years, but I've been in Korea at least a little bit of every year since 2015. Wow. So you like being in Korea. I do, yeah, that's why I keep on coming back. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know, because you're a friend of mine, I know that you study Korean I do. really hard. I do. You're yes. in school now, and uh, you're you're going for like super high fluency, I guess, is that your I am, yeah, goal? yeah, that's that's definitely one of my one of my biggest goals being here in Korea is, is really to be able to speak with Koreans as naturally as possible, you know, using the words that they use and, and just being able to understand everything almost to the same level that they can. Great, I love it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Specificity is good. So the, the topic we're gonna talk about now is Konglish words. Ah, yes. How would you define Konglish words? I would describe Konglish words as words that sound like English or at least have English uh, they like they they seem to come from English, but they have completely different meanings from what we imagine them to be when we hear them. Yeah, I'm happy with that. <laughs> right I've got a list of some here that that people just may not immediately know when they hear it. That uh, you know might need a little bit of an explanation about what these words mean. Yeah, they can kind of throw native English speakers off. Right, so they might hear it and think, oh yeah, I totally know what that is, but then they learn what it actually means and they're like, whoa, that's completely different from what I was expecting. Yeah, and this could also be very helpful for people who are studying English. They could falsely assume that these Konglish words are indeed, you know, standard English, used by natives, but they're actually not. So why don't you hit me with one of the words on your list? Uh, I had uh, saida. The Korean word saida really refers to like a Sprite type drink. I guess here usually it refers to like chilsung saida. Yeah. yeah. But really, I, I mean, it refers to like any kind of drink like that. Probably like Seven Up, Sprite, chilsung if you're here in Korea. Um, any of those 
drinks, any of those soft drinks. Yeah. But the English word cider, like or cider, would be like an alcoholic beverage. Yeah, or even just apple cider. Or yeah, or even just apple cider. Which, which I love. So do I, absolutely. And, and so that might really throw some people off because if an English speaker hears cider, they might be thinking apple cider or, or maybe like, a, like an alcoholic beverage cider, but really all they're really talking about is like a Sprite-like beverage, yeah. a clear, um, usually like lemon-lime flavored soda. Bobori? Bobori. Yeah, bobori. And so, I mean, this refers to like a Burberry coat, but in English, Burberry is, is, a, is a brand name. But, but in, in Korean, the word Bobori just refers to like any kind of trench coat. Yeah. Really. So um, I guess this one, it, it's the same thing. It's just a lot more narrow to use the English word Burberry because, I mean, it's, it's a brand. It's a very specific yeah. uh, you know, brand of coat versus the so Korean interesting. word. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that the way that must have originated is Burberry was the main brand yeah. of trench coat people were wearing. Definitely. And people saw the Burberry tag or something. This is just what I'm imagining. They just thought it was called a Burberry. I'd almost be interested to see how some of these words actually come into the Korean vernacular the way they do. Yeah. Like, was it because Burberry was the most prominent company making these coats or was it for some other reason? Yeah, we would just say trench coat. Right. Burberry, they all actually make really nice shirts too. I was gonna say, I think they make a bunch of different yeah. uh, just clothing and, yeah. and, and that kind of stuff, hats and, and everything. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really kind of narrow if you hear Burberry to think only the coat. Yeah, actually when I hear Burberry, I think of like dress shirt. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. it, I mean, it is, it's kind of a fancier brand, but it's not really a, a cheap brand either. It's kind of a, a more upscale brand. Trouble, so, or, or in the Korean eyes, you know, trouble. And uh, trouble in the, the Korean meaning of it is refers to acne. Usually it's you know about, about something going bad with your skin, especially now since everybody's wearing masks outside and everything. Mm. It's really doing a number on everybody's skin. So you know people probably seeing a lot of trouble you know these days. <laughs> but you know the English word trouble is is much more broad and certainly doesn't refer to acne on on somebody's face. It just refers to a a general sense of a problem coming from yeah. somewhere. Yeah, and yeah, Koreans, they have that word munje, which is mm -hmm. just problem or trouble. Acne, pimple. A pimple or acne. Uh, breaking out, I'm breaking yeah, break, out. Yeah, breaking out, yeah, that's a good one. Breaking Some out acne, pimples, yeah. breaking out pimples or zits. And, uh, I woke up and I had a zit on my face. Yeah. Uh, Although I will say when you do break out with zits, acne or pimples, it does cause a lot of trouble. It does, yes. Very so stressful. I see the connection, like the connection is there, but it's just not immediately clear why yeah. they would say that about, uh, about acne. But maybe it's because, you know, there's a higher sense of skincare here. So if you start breaking out, they probably really do refer to that as, yeah. as trouble. All right, anything else you want to say about this topic in general, Konglish words? I think there's a clear difference between Konglish words and loan words. Oh, so, they're different. What I mean, exactly. Like they're they're almost completely different. Loan words is really just it's the English word that almost just is pronounced with a Korean pronunciation, mm -hmm. and really is is almost the exact same meaning. Whereas Konglish, like we just went over, is is words that sound like they're English, and you may assume that they have the same English meaning if you hear that word in English, but it actually has a very sometimes a very different meaning. Right on. Yeah, it's an important distinction to make. Yes, definitely. Well said. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, where are you from? Hi, I'm Bella and I'm from Australia. Great. So you've been in Korea now three years, is that correct? Three years, yes. What are some Konglish words that are kind of shocking in how different they are to their English corresponding meaning? So probably the first one that I really didn't know was when I was teaching English actually and people would say, oh, after this I'm going to my Arba. Okay. And I was like, huh? Your what? And they were like, Arabite. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's not English, that's German, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So they were really convinced, no, that's how you say part time work. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I had to teach them, no, 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 Alba is not even English, it's yeah. German. You can't even say that that's Konglish because that yeah, doesn't no. really come from English. No, it doesn't. Though it is a loan word from another mm -hmm. language, and it yeah. often gets lumped up in Konglish. It does, yeah. What, what would we say in, in English? Just part time job. That's yeah. right, yeah. Part-time job, part-time mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. The other words I experienced when I was like shopping online, 
I was looking and I saw one piece. One piece. And I was like, one piece? What is that? It's not the anime. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is a dress, which yeah. makes sense because it's like one piece of clothing, right? But I never thought of a dress as like a one piece yeah. of clothing. Uh, but it makes sense. It, yeah, and that's the piece. thing I notice a lot about these Kangas words is a lot of them do make a lot of sense. Yeah, they and, do. <laughs> and even some of them are actually more logical than their corresponding English words. Mm -hmm. what, what would you call one piece in English? Just a dress. How about this one? Mm. Rinse. Rinse? Mm. Even if you say it in English, rinse. Rinse. What do you think it means? Something to do with showering. I've oh. seen it before. I've, no, 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 wait. I've seen it She's before. She's smart. It's for your hair. Mm -hmm. Is it conditioner? That's right. Ah, okay. Oh. I remember seeing the bottle, but yeah. actually if someone said, oh, I need rinse, I would have no idea. Yeah, me too. Actually, a long time ago when I first heard rinse or mm. rinse, mm -hmm. I thought it meant like mouthwash. Uh. Rinse your mouth. Because that's uh. what my father always said when, in, when I was young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, brush your teeth, then rinse your mouth out. So let's do the last one. Okay. MT. Ah, I know this you one. Know, all right. <laughs> Membership training. Okay. What is it? It's orientation. Orientation is a yeah. good way to say it. Yeah. Because yeah. they have MT for like university too, right? I think so, yeah. because yeah, that's how I learned it, was from my students going, oh, I went to MT. I'm like, what's MT? But they would go somewhere and usually drink a lot to get to know people. Yeah. But with companies too, they have MT. It's just orientation, getting yeah. to know each other, getting to know the company or the school or something like that. I think orientation is exactly right. That's yeah. exactly what you would call it. But mm -hmm. the funny thing is MT, membership training. Uh -huh. It sounds very professional. Very professional, yeah. yeah. But I always notice that when Koreans are like, oh, I'm going to MT, they're very excited and they're very yeah, happy. Yeah, right. <laughs> which makes me feel like it's more of like a party kind mm. of atmosphere, which it is, right? For university, I think it for is. For at least university. Yeah, yeah, for companies, I don't think it's such a party. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's just like kind of uh, building camaraderie. Yeah, it's like team building exercises, yeah, that which kind are, of thing. Which are fun. Yeah, it is. If you like your team, yeah. yeah if you like your team. <laughs> There's like a game component to it. Yeah. And I guess it's like different from conventional office work, so mm -hmm. it could be fun. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so orientation. Mm. All right. All right, well, this was very fun and educational, yeah. I hope, to people. Mm -hmm. I learned a few things. Yeah. yeah, me too. Right on. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, bye bye. Bye. Hi, how's it going? Where are you from? Uh, good, uh, my name is James. I'm from originally from Vancouver, Canada. How long have you been in Korea anyway? Well, I've been in and out of Korea for the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, but officially, like living here for the last two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do, do you speak Korean? Have you been learning Korean? Well, okay, so yeah, yeah, I grew up in a Korean household. Obviously, okay. my background is Korean. Um, so my first language was actually technically Korean because mm. my grandmother raised raised us, but um, lost that pretty quickly as soon as I went to school. Yeah, right? a lot of people say that. Yeah, um, actually, television is the one that really killed my Korean. Ah. Um, after moving here officially, my wife is Korean, so I mean she's a native to here. And so she speaks a lot of Korean to me. So the, I've got the ear for it. I just the tongue just can't catch up. Mm. Uh, Korean so, pronunciation so is pretty hard, right? Uh, it can be. Yeah. yeah, it can be for sure. There's a lot of uh, the vowels especially are a lot rounder and the tongue has to manip be manipulated in different ways. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I talk to other language learning, like friends of mine who learn either Japanese or other languages all around the world. And whenever we talk about Korean, the Korean language, mm -hmm. we always say one of the hardest parts of the Korean language, more than many other languages, is the pronunciation. Absolutely. Yeah, the vowels, the, the double consonants. Right. When you go to this vowel, and it quickly changes to like another vowel, like awulida. Right. Like, oh, right. it's hard. <laughs> right, right, totally. So, Konglish words are words that were originally English, but kind of adapted and adopted yes. into the Korean language. And their meanings have kind of morphed to the extent that many native speakers can't even guess what their meanings are. Right. Yeah. So, I'm going to give you a small test. Okay. Let's see. I'm ready for it. How good your knowledge is on Konglish words. Okay, I'm gonna probably fail, but let's let's no. give it an attempt. You'll do well. Okay. You'll do well. Start off easy. Okay. Driver. Screwdriver. Yes. Demo. Demo. Like demolition? 
Nope. No. Demonstration? I don't know. Yes. Is it? Okay. Yes, but okay. what kind of demonstration? My, my mind goes to like a demo tape, like a music demo tape, but it, obviously that's not it. So do you give up on demo? I do give up on demo. Protest. Oh. Like a demonstration. So yeah, it's a demonstration like protest, which is not quite the, the album demo that right. we were talking about, but <laughs> yeah, so like at Soul Station, there's a demonstration against violence against uh, lab rats or whatever. Right. You know? <laughs> right. So what would we say in English? There's a what? Protest. Yeah. I would say protest or rally. Rally. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah, maybe a rally. Yeah. Or even in Korean, there's like they use undong to talk about like a movement. All right. So we would say maybe rally or protest. Yeah. Do you see what I mean by Konglish now? I do. They're like appropriated English words, yeah. right? Um, Adopted and slightly altered. Yes. Into English. Almost a almost a separate language in and of itself. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But we do it too in English. Every language does it. It's kind of sure. like a natural thing that languages do. But as native English speakers, I always find that it's just so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because they're not that far off. Right. Like you could say demonstration and it would make sense right. if you said it in context so people knew what you were talking about. Right. Yeah. There's right. a Absolutely. demonstration against, what would you say, or a demonstration of what? How would you use that in a sentence? A demonstration against the raising of student loans. That's a big one that always happens back home, yeah. back in Vancouver. Okay, yeah. let's go to another one. Sure. Takyu. Takyu. Drawing a complete blank on that one. Alright, I'll give you a hint. Okay. 저는 다큐를 보는 것을 좋아해요. I like to watch takyu. Oh, docu documentaries. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Would we say docu? Ah, uh, docs. I think a lot of people, the kids refer to them as docs okay. these days. I haven't even heard of that one. Yeah, docs. A lot of docs on Netflix, I guess. It's funny, there's some words that are indeed long, like documentary. Right. But me personally and all the people surrounding me, my friends, family, were content to just say the full word. Right. Like documentary. Right. Or electric scooter. Right. Like that's another one. Like kickboard is what they would say here. Ah, uh, okay. You seen that kickboard? Right, yeah. But we don't, would not say kickboard. No. We just say electric scooter or right. electronic scooter. It's so long. I think it's an age thing too. <laughs> right? I think kids are slowly shortening the, the, the language to, to abbreviated words. Yeah, that is true. Slang, yeah. abbreviated words in Korean and in English. The torch is carried by the young people. Yeah, absolutely. They're definitely the pioneers of that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Eye shopping. Eye shopping, like window shopping. Oh, well, that's easy. Yeah, that's an easy yeah. one. So we would say window shopping. <clears throat> yeah, window shopping. I don't yeah. think there's any other term for that, but... Yeah, that's right, window shopping. Yeah. Or just browsing. Yeah. Clip. Clip. Like a hair clip? Nope. Okay, how about a hint? You're working in an office, and you need these sometimes. Like a paper clip? Yes. Okay. So we would say paper clip. Right. There's really no other way to say that. No, there isn't. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like paperclip. It's clean, it's short. Paperclip. Sure. Yeah. Explains what it does. Yeah. Yeah. I guess Koreans want it even shorter. Yeah. Chongi <laughs> clip. I didn't even say that. Yeah. Bijuol. Bijuol? Bijuol. Like bejeweled? No. Bijuol. Um, oh, I'm going to need a hint on this one too. Maybe this was the hard one. <laughs> I'll say it in English. Visual. Bijuol. Bijuor. Yeah, in the, I can't think of the context of that. Just the appearance of something. Okay. Bijuor take a while. Ah, okay. The appearance, it looks ah, good. Ah, okay. So like, if you were a cook uh -huh. and you make this, you know, extravagant dish. Right. And the visual aspect of it looks good. That is separate from how it tastes. Right. But visual could be used in this way. Oh wow, the visual is really good. Your haircut looks good, or like, mm. or like the set looks good. I like the way you organize the lighting and all this stuff on the movie set. Right. A visual could be in in many ways used. Mm. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. But you wouldn't say that in English. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> what would we say? I, I think it's context specific like yeah right it would be context specific yeah or aesthetic aesthetically aesthetically pleasing exactly. aesthetically it looks good yeah that's a hard word to say it is aesthetic aesthetic it's the <laughs> aes it's a, a s t h yeah, yeah. Oof. yeah. sorry everybody <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think any final words any last things you want to say about conglish it's fun 
especially from from like a, the westerners uh, perspective yeah because it's interesting to see other cultures and languages sort of adopt your own language right right all right well thank you so much james thank you all right <laughs> see you guys later bye Hey, where are you from? Hi, uh, my name's Chad and I'm from the United States. So how long have you been living in Korea? So overall, the time I've spent in Korea hasn't even been two years, but mm -hmm. I've really been in Korea at least for a short amount of time every year since 2015. Wow, it's fair to say he's a fan I of this country. Absolutely, that's why I keep on coming back here. Yeah, and I'm torturing him today. We're gonna talk about a slightly embarrassing topic, but very interesting, at least to me. Dating culture here. Uh, dating yes. with Koreans. Yes, yes. So I want to know if there are any like shocking cultural differences or just interesting things you've noticed in your experience, like going on a date with a Korean girl. There's lots of cultural differences in dating between here and, and being in the United States or perhaps in any Western country, yeah. just the Western notion of dating. Um, one that really comes to mind almost immediately is uh, couple outfits. Okay. It, it's one of the most visible things that, that, that you see among couples in, in Korea is that they, they look like twins. They're wearing the exact same clothing from head to toe. You know, same shirt, same pants, same shoes sometimes. So it's really something that you really see right away, but that's something that you would almost never see in the United States. In fact, if I saw that in the US, maybe outside LA where there's lots of Koreans, I would think it's very strange yeah. to see that. I wonder what the psychology behind that is. Like, what is the instinct to wear the same thing come from? Maybe it's it's a feeling of a connection. I think it does come from connection. Even like if you're on like a basketball team, everybody has the same jersey. You're part of something. Exactly. If you're in the army, everybody's wearing the same thing. Yeah, you're exactly. part of something. Exactly. If you have a couple t-shirt, you guys are part of a group. It's exclusive. Exactly, yes. So yeah, yeah it's almost like you're, you're on the same team. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a team couple and you're also kind of showing it off there's kind of an aspect to that yes you're, you're kind of parading it around the fact that you're dating yeah absolutely I mean there, there's no question that if you see two people uh, wearing the same clothing from head to toe there's no question that they are together you know yeah. it's, it's not like you would approach um, a girl sitting in a cafe with a guy who's wearing the exact mm. same clothing and ask her for her number that would be that would be ludicrous would you participate in this culture or would you personally be kind of hesitant and kind of against it? So I, I did experience this once, but it wasn't here in Korea. It was actually back in the United States. I was dating a, a Korean girl at the time and she wanted to buy me. It was, it was a shirt that said, um, I'm dating a crazy South Korean girl or something, something like that. And then she would have one that's almost matching saying, I'm the crazy South Korean girl. You know, something, something to that effect. Did you wear it? I did not. Well done. I did not because that is very cringy. <laughs> Extremely exactly. I think I cringy. took. I think I took one look at it, one look at it, and I was like, I, I can't. Wait. That's just <laughs> yeah. it's a little, a little strange. A little too much. Yeah. yeah. It was. It was a little much at the time. What but, if it was just like a Pokemon shirt? like two Pokemon shirts. Sure, so part of the reason I think I was so against that was because it was in English and it wasn't even, I mean, it was a couple outfit for sure, but it wasn't something that you would see here. Yeah. Here, it can be anything. It could be this shirt that I'm wearing today with jeans and the same shoes and that's a couple outfit and that's right. fine. That was a little bit, you know, that was a little bit of an extreme situation. If, if it was something like that, a Pokemon shirt or even just what we would consider like normal clothing, I'm, I don't think I would have a problem with it now. Right on. Cool. I think I've also just become a little bit more accustomed to that um, as a feature of being in a, in a relationship with Koreans is that that is something that happens. At yeah. the time, I didn't even know about that, so mm -hmm. it kind of caught me off guard as well. So one of the other things that really kind of stands out in stark contrast to maybe the Western notion of dating is PDA, mm -hmm. you know, or public displays of affection yeah. here in Korea. So in the United States, you know, if you kiss your girlfriend in public, it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah. You know, hugging, holding hands, all of these things are, are very commonplace. They're something that you would see on any occasion. But here in Korea, it's much more conservative. And so you'll see plenty of couples holding hands or, or hugging and, and that's fine. But it's a rare experience to see couples kissing in a public location. True. I think clubs, that's normal. Or like a bar, that's normal. But I, you're totally right. Yeah. And it's funny, there's really a spectrum. I remember I, uh, I was uh, studying abroad in Italy. Mm -hmm. 
and I think a lot of young Italians um, are kind of known for being very free uh, in terms of how they express their affection sure. to their romantic partners. And I remember being in the park and there was just a couple just making out mm. on the grass. And I was just like, well, whatever. And then in America, it's a step more on the conservative. Sure. You know, you can kiss your girl on the bus. It's fine. You can kiss your boyfriend. Korea is kind of in the next step or there's probably steps in between. But yeah. but, even, but Japan would be even more oh, yeah? Yeah, conservative in that regard than oh, wow. Korea. So in Korea, you could still hold your girl's hand or like hold her from behind. Yes. It's actually really cute. I see a lot of uh, these young couples riding these kickboards. Yes. And yes. the girls in the front and the yep. guys in the back. I yes, think exactly. I think it's really cute. It's yeah. very romantic. Honestly, yeah, it's, it's kind of adorable. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's nice. They're even riding the scooter together. Be safe, but have fun, you know? But there yeah. is a spectrum, right? There is, yeah. And, and I mean, my experience with that is a little bit I don't want to say it's extreme, but because I have seen some couples who, you know, there'll be a nice little like peck or something, you know, in public and it's not really that big a deal. Nobody's going to like look at them and like try to shame them. How dare you do this in public? But I was dating a girl here at one time and even in the privacy of her own car, she wouldn't let me kiss her in her car because she was so conscious of, you know, cameras in the parking lot yeah. or, you know, anything like that, that she was like, no, I, I don't even want to do it here in the privacy of the car. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So another thing that, I, that I've noticed is a little bit different about things that maybe people from different countries consider when they want to date somebody mm -hmm. in Korea is, is hygiene mm. and personal appearance. So. Here in Korea, I mean, you can argue that it's a little superficial here. People really care about their, their appearance and how they look and how, you know, the makeup that they've got and sometimes they get plastic surgery and stuff like that. But one thing that I, that I noticed that's a different, at least from the United States, is that sometimes uh, hygiene practices are a little bit different here. As, a, as an American, I'm generally used to girls, they'll shave their legs. But here I've noticed that, um, you know, women will wear stockings a lot, which, you know, you can't really tell them. But I've noticed that, you know, if girls are wearing shorts or something and they're not wearing stockings, sometimes you'll see that they haven't, they, they don't shave their legs. Mm -hmm. And that might really catch some people off guard or might be a turnoff for some people from, you know, from Western cultures where it's a little bit more commonplace for, for women to shave their legs. <laughs> I haven't noticed that, that's interesting. Yeah, sometimes I think that it's just because it seems like they don't grow as much hair on, yeah. on their legs just in the first place. So there's really no, you know, strong feeling that they need to shave their legs. Yeah. But I've also noticed that there are other parts of the body that, you know, <laughs> women also don't shave and, and, you know, their armpits. I've noticed that, you know, sometimes you'll see women, you know, maybe in the summer or whatever, when they're wearing a t-shirt, they'll raise their arm and, you know, they don't have shaved armpits, which mm. again is something you might see in Europe, but not so much in the U.S. Ah, very interesting. So, I mean, there, and there's certainly nothing wrong with, with any of that. It caught me a little bit off guard the first few times I saw it, but, uh, but I mean, there's nothing, and certainly nothing wrong with that. It's just something that, you know, is a little bit different. Yeah. A little bit unexpected. It's a good one. Another thing that I've noticed is a little bit different about dating here in Korea is that uh, there are some differences in cultural values here. I find that many children, just in general, will live with their parents mm. until, until they get married, right? So that kind of makes some of the more intimate moments in dating a little bit more difficult because you don't have a place of your own to go back to to kind of have some private moments and so I mean there's a big motel culture here um, you know that just kind of serves as that sort of place where you can get away have some private time with your significant other and, and do some of that stuff yeah but it's definitely something that's different from the United States there are motels in the United States but they don't really serve that very specific purpose of you know getting out of your parents house to go have some some alone time with your significant other yeah um, and, and the funny thing that comes to my mind in regards to that is like that is pretty much only the case if you're dating somebody who is from Gyeonggi-do or Seoul if you're dating someone from Busan and they're living in Seoul or from Gwangju they're living in Seoul or Jeju they have to live on their own. That's true. And I also find more and more people are moving out on their own, although there's still a large percentage of people that do live with their families. But I always found that to be interesting. Like you, you, you find people that are not from Seoul are forced to live on their own. Right. So in that regard, like these 
people, even as friends or your, the lovers or you're just dating. These kind of young Koreans have more freedom. Yeah. And that's by no choice or anything. It's just by necessity. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Especially with lots of just domestic movement of people to different cities. You, you do find that a lot more people are living on their own. Um, I mean, it's in the news every once in a while that mm. single person households are growing here. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's definitely something that's happening, but especially if your parents live in the same location as you do, or at least generally, you know, you'll find that children will live with their parents until they get married. I wouldn't say it makes it difficult, but it makes it a little bit harder to kind of get those private alone, you know, private moments with your significant other. For sure. Um, especially if, you know, marriage is not something that's really on the table at that in, time. In the immediate future. Yeah. Right, exactly. And, and you know, on, on that note, you know, there's a little bit of like a value difference okay. for, you know, wanting to get married here. You know, from a Western perspective, you know, we'll we'll get married, you know, based on, you know, oh, well, we feel like we're ready to get married, where we have this emotional connection yeah. and want to do that. I find that, you know, that exists here, absolutely. It's just not quite as strong. That's not the top priority. Here, I find that sometimes it's, well, do we have a place to move to? Yeah. You know, do we have a place to call our own mm. when we get married? Mm. And I find that a lot of times, you know, couples won't get married until they reach that sort of financial stability that they can move out and, you know, either buy a home or get a, uh, a nice apartment on like a Jonze and move out that way. Having a, a rent, a month to month rent is something that I feel it's a lot less common here. I would say I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. No. Personally, no. like I like I like the uh, practicality of it. Absolutely. Like if you're going to start a family and support a marriage, I, I like the fact that like they want to be financially responsible and ready for that because I there are a lot of people who take on this incredible responsibility are totally not ready. Yes. And that could be very unfair to the children as well. But um, that's very interesting. Nonetheless, very true. Yes, I was gonna say, and, and again, that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's just yeah. something that's a little bit different from perhaps a Western perspective of, of dating and, and really preparing for marriage. It's, you know, are you, are you really financially ready to do that? And sometimes it might even seem like a, a prerequisite for getting married. Oh, do you have the money to buy a home? Yeah. Because if, if you don't, we're not going to do it yet. Yeah. You know? Right on. Yeah. Cool. All right. You've mentioned some very interesting and thought provoking things. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. See you later. See you later. Hi, where are you from? Hi, I'm Bella and I'm from Australia. So, how long have you been living here in Korea? I've been living in Seoul specifically for three years. Yeah. Wow, it's quite a while. I was teaching English for two years and then uh, I decided to stop and I've been studying Korean since then and doing freelance modeling as well. Right on, yeah. awesome. What is your impression of dating culture here in Korea and what have been things that have been shocking to you, you know, just as you've been introduced to them? Australians are more kind of individual people in a sense. If you're in a relationship, you're not messaging them all the time, you're not mm. hanging out with them 24-7 mm. and there's not really like couple days, couples outfits, things like that. Whereas in Korea, it's kind of the opposite. What I have discovered is that as soon as someone is interested in you, they'll message you all the time. Okay. Like in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> And throughout the day, uh -huh. uh -huh. And then before you go to sleep, like every day is kind of like that mm -hmm. for me actually that's a bit overwhelming i need some like space yeah. from whoever i'm dating so i feel like that's yeah so yeah. i feel like that's a big difference and i'm not saying that koreans don't have their own lives but when they become a couple they're really invested in each other you talked about texting and yeah. communication mm -hmm. is this more of a bella thing or is this an australian thing the fact that you think relationships should have more space and individuality I think it's a Bella thing. It's a Bella thing. Because I want to know, because I want to know what is like the perfect ratio? How often should you communicate in text? Because for me mm. personally, even as an American Westerner, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and although I have lived in Korea for a while, yeah. I like it when I see, you know, my significant other text me because mm -hmm. it makes me think that they're thinking about me. Yeah. But I agree with you if it's too often, mm. it can be a bit burdensome. So I, what would be like the perfect amount, the frequency? I don't think it's about the frequency. Okay. I think it's about the intention. So 
what it feels like to me, and I could be wrong, but in Korea it feels like an obligation. Like I have to message you good morning, and I have to ask you if you've eaten three meals a day, and I have to say good night. Because if you don't, then you're a bad boyfriend or girlfriend. Is that right? That's the impression I get. Mm. Whereas, you know, just tell me about your day. Text me like, oh, I saw this cute dog. Or I'm thinking of you at lunch or something. I think that is more genuine. So I don't care about the frequency as much as like the intention behind it and why you're actually messaging me. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe other people feel the same. I mean, it's case by case. For sure. Yeah, it just depends on the person and every relationship's different, right? Absolutely. So you have to communicate regardless of whether it's I'm dating a Korean or I'm dating an Australian. Everyone's We're dating someone from Mars. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> everything's going to be different. So you just have to communicate. And if it's too much, you tell them. If it's not enough, then you have to balance that out. Great. Mm. Cool. OK, I like that answer. There's so many couples days in Korea. In Australia, there's just Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then if you have your anniversary, usually it's like six months and then one year and then two years, three years, that kind of thing. Here it's what Valentine's Day, White Day, Black Day is for single people, but was also turned into kind of a couple's holiday. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> they took that from <laughs> single people. Too. They took it from the single people. There's you celebrate a hundred days, a thousand days, one year, right? Mm -hmm. And all of those things. I don't think it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Well, in Australia, would you not celebrate one year? I feel like you would celebrate. You celebrate that. one year, but you don't celebrate like a hundred days. True. And that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so there's more celebrations, which. Actually, I think it's cute. You can speak freely. <laughs> yeah. If you I'm, don't think it's cute, no, that's no, no, fine no, no. too. No, I think it is cute. But again, I think it depends on the couple and I, I don't like when anything feels like an obligation in a okay. relationship. Okay. Don't celebrate 100 days because you feel like you have to. Do it because you are genuinely happy you made it to 100 days with the person. Is there anything else you want to say about this topic, Bella? Mm. Or was that pretty much it? I think I've covered it. I right. mean, every country has different dating cultures, but in the end, it's just dependent on the people mm -hmm. and communication is the most important thing. You know, you cannot ignore cultural differences. No. Being in a relationship with someone, where is the line between individual difference in that person and mm -hmm. cultural difference? I don't think you can remove culture from the person. Okay, so is everything just case by case? I mean, I don't want to say that. Why not? Because it's kind of a cop out, right? If I say, oh, it's always case by case. Uh -huh. But a person's personality is molded by the culture they grew up in, Okay. right? Um, so the way I think about relationships is based on what I've seen in Australia and from my parents and my friends. And Koreans also have that view, but they were raised in a different environment. So it is case by case, but I don't think you can remove culture from the individual. And in that sense, relationships are not always 50-50, right? Okay. Sometimes, person's having a bad day, this person has to give more. Sometimes it's the other way. That's just how relationships work. Yeah. But I think mm, what could be a problem is if one person is too stubborn and like holds on to their culture so much that they don't want to even listen to the other person mm. or see their point of view. Um, because having your own culture and your own ideas isn't a bad thing, but being so attached to it that you can't see from a different point of view, that's what causes problems. You nailed it. I think that last statement really crystallized how I really feel in general. It's like, so of course we're all different, mm -hmm. but if you are viewing the world and your partner who is not from your culture mm -hmm. too heavily through your own cultural lens and yeah. holding them to the same standards mm -hmm. and holding them to things that you yourself would assume to be obvious mm -hmm. because they're not obvious. They're not, yeah. That's where problems come. Yeah. Like, I can't believe you did this. Don't you know that you can't do that? Well, mm -hmm. no, I don't know that I can't do that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Did that make sense? It did make sense, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right on. All right, interesting. Well, thank you so much. It's okay. Thank yeah. you for having me. Right on. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh, the other thing too, in terms of like interpersonal relationships is, you know, calling friends out of the blue just to say, hey, what's up? Um, I don't think that's a common thing in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, in, back in Canada, it's, it's a common thing. I mean, um, these days it's more moving towards texting, but you know, you'll get an occasional phone call or I'll make an occasional phone call once in a while and say, hey, I just want to see how things are going. 
What's it's, new? So interesting. I don't like when friends call me. Yeah. Just text me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're of that group. I think that's. Uh, a, I think that's a generational thing too. Maybe I don't know. I'm old school that way. Of that group. Oh, burn. You're one of those. That's too funny. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm definitely a hugger and a caller. <laughs> You're a boomer. <laughs> you were born in 1980. 1980. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. You're, you look younger. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm getting I'm getting there. I'm getting there age wise. Yeah. But yeah. Cool. All right. Well. Well, thank you so much again, thank James. You. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. I'll see you next time. Um, another thing that you know is is quite a bit different here versus the U.S. That maybe the U.S. could learn from Korea is the residence renting system hmm. that Korea has here. So, you know, as, as, as you know very well, you know, there's, there's two systems here of, you know, Wose and Jonse. And, you know, one, you, you pay money every month and you've got a deposit. It's very similar to renting in, in the US. But the other system is unheard of in the United States. You know, mm -hmm. you pay this, this almost astounding amount of money, you know, to, to rent a place, but you have no monthly payment, you know, mm. you, so you end up you end up potentially saving a bunch of money because you're not having to make that monthly payment to your landlord every month. And I think that's something that you know could be implemented in the United States if you know if it's handled very carefully. Yeah. Real estate is definitely a tricky subject, and I am not an expert at all. I definitely see it as a good thing that you know has a lot of potential benefits. Yeah. Cool. Wow. You watched the video all the way to the end. Congratulations. You're amazing. Thank you so much for watching everyone. Once again, I'm Sean and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.